Well, it's 17 degrees outside on this cold, cold morning, but that's not going to stop me from making one of the one of the best briskets in the world. And I'm going to break up this video into to parts like I normally do. Um, show you guys how to do the trim. Show you how to smoke it, how to cook it, how to know when to wrap, how to, what to wrap with, uh, and also uh, how to slice it, how to know when it's done. So, All right, so here it is. This is the brisket. So this is a prime grade brisket that I bought yesterday, so it hasn't been frozen. Um, just refrigerated. Let it sit out a little bit this morning. I like to let it get a little bit of to temperature, and that really helps with cooking to help it you know, cook a little bit quicker. Um, it does make it a little bit harder to trim, but that's okay. So some things that I like to look for on a brisket is just the fat cap on top. Make sure it looks normal. Make sure it looks natural. Um, you want to look for any like abnormal growth. Make sure it doesn't look different. Make sure it doesn't look like it's been modified or enhanced or anything like that. Just want to, want to find a brisket that looks natural. It looks like it just grew up the way it's supposed to. And it looks like it just kind of, you know, it doesn't have any like growth hormones or wasn't forced to grow um, in a way that's abnormal, just in any way. So just regular fat, look for fat, like white fat, good fat all the way across the top. Especially in a prime grade, you're going to find good fat all the way across the top. You're also going to find um, just the marbling in the meat. You know, that's really what makes uh, any great beef uh, prime grade is the meat itself. Um, if you ever want to, you know, you can always get choice grade too. Just try to look for a choice grade that has good marbling in it. Look for a choice grade that's more like on the high end. Um, and you can still make some pretty good stuff, you know. Uh, an idea I guess I just had for a video, maybe one day I'll make a video where I'll make a choice grade and a prime grade and compare the two so that um, you all can see what the difference is and what it looks like. So I'm going to show you how I do my trimming. Um, I do my trimming different than a lot of people, probably cut off a lot more than what most people do. But I, I found the way that I trim is, is the best for me and works the best for me. So I'm going to go ahead and show that. Oh, this, just for reference too, this is a 16-pound brisket. So a little bit bigger than I normally go with. Normally I try to stick with uh, 15 pounds at the most. But um, this is the best one that I could find at the store that looked, that looked natural, that looked normal. So this is the one that I went with. Uh, let's get started with the trimming. So I like to really look at trimming my meat in a way that I'm not going, I don't like to keep things that I'm not necessarily going to eat if I don't have to. So a lot of times I'll start on the bottom, start just by trimming away some of this fat right here, across the bottom of it, just try to get this trimmed down. Um, it's not really necessary, it's just going to drip onto the, into the bottom of the pit and make it so that it's not... It's just a waste, you know, and fat, in my experience, doesn't really absorb smoke flavor. It blocks smoke flavor from getting into the meat. The meat is where we want the flavor. The meat is where that flavor um, is most impactful. So just kind of, kind of try to trim up some of the fat, trim up some of the corners. With an offset smoker like mine, you got to think that the air is flowing you know, over the top of it. So the top is where most of the heat's going to be, but also I want to make it so that this thing is shaped so that the air can flow freely and smoothly over the entire thing. I don't want to make it so that it is so that air is going to stop flowing anywhere across this thing. Um, I trim up a lot of the edges. Um, any pieces that are hanging off, I'll trim as well, like this piece right here. You know, and, and you can all these trimming pieces and you can reuse them. You can put them in beans if you want to. You can make sausage out of them. Whatever you want to do, you can use the fat to make a tallow with. But in any case, the important thing is, is that we just don't, we want to put all of our focus into putting the flavors, putting the meat, putting the juiciness into the meat that we're actually going to eat. Um, so for me, I find Cutting off the parts that I'm not that are, are going to dry out or are not going to be good. I don't want to waste any of my flavors, any of my smoke, any of my heat on those things. 
I want to put all that into what I'm actually going to eat. Um, I don't want, I want to put it in anything that I'm going to cut off later on. So there's something too that I look for in a brisket and I look for, look at the flat, you know, try to find one that's, it's thicker, it's bigger. Um, that's always good too. If you get one, like this part here on the end here is like thin. Sometimes you'll get them where like it's thin for like halfway, you know, and that, that that's probably a waste because you're not going to use all that. Um, most of that you're going to, it's going to dry out. So something to look here. On the side, this is cauterized, so this is where they, they cut it from the breastbone of the of the of the uh, the cow. So this one, if you look at it like this, this is how it was on the cow, just like this. And this right here is where the breastbone was. So this is actually a left side brisket. Um, a lot of people think that, that matters for me. I don't think it does, but what I like to do is trim off this whole side where it was cauterized. I don't really want that cauterized meat being used or being going in the smoker. I don't think it's great. I think, you know, it's the natural process of what happens, but cauterized meat to me just doesn't sound very good. I want to make it so that it is as good as possible. Something that I, I, I personally never do is I never, I never inject brisket. I never inject beef in general. Um, I feel like it's a crime to inject something that has such fantastic natural flavoring without being injected. So I always try to make it with my cooking, especially with beef and with, br with brisket. The natural flavor is really what stands out the most with my... Uh, meats and with brisket there's a whole lot of natural flavor in it that we really just want to try to bring out if we can and I get that there's a lot of people that don't like to trim their briskets they just you know cut up in the package pull them out season them and throw them in um, for me I just found that that's not always the best choice that it's better to trim it better to make it so that everything can flow really well um, get rid of all the, a lot of the excess fat that really isn't needed, and um, it's just going to block, it's just going to block smoke, it's not actually going to do anything to enhance the meat or the flavor. And if you're somebody that doesn't, you know, that loves the, that ton of meat and all those things, like, by all means, keep it that way, but for me, I like aerodynamically sound so the air can flow over it. Um, I'm not a huge, I'm honestly not a huge fat person, so I like to trim off probably more fat than, than a lot of people do, but, um, so here's what I do, and then I just go through here, start trimming up, see all this fat, this is just, I mean, this is just like a block, solid fat. That right there is blocking smoke. So, um, you know, try to get it so that like along the flat, it's about a quarter inch thick on the fat. Um, there's still quite a bit there. Probably trim off this end over here that's, uh, that's thinner. It doesn't have as much meat to it because it's just not going to work. Oh, you know, and the knife that I use is, is a boning knife. Um, I try to get just a razor sharp, super sharp knife. I like the bone knife, I like the shape of it because it's just easy to dig in and slice and cut. Um, but really any sharp knife is going to work. Just make sure that it's uh, not dull and it should be okay. If it's dull, you might have a hard time trimming a brisket. So maybe that's could be a good reason to not. Oh, went a little too deep there. That's okay. You know, we can, we can, we can compensate for that for sure. Not a big deal. Now, but anyways, you know, something I was mentioning, you know, if you want to, um, if you want to, if you, if you really feel like you just have to, um, inject your brisket or marinate it or whatever, 
Um, to me, again, I, I really feel like that's just a crime. But if, if you really feel like you want to, you need to, I would say just go with something that's like natural beef flavoring. Uh, maybe mix some, um, maybe mix some, um, some broth with some apple cider vinegar. You know, cider vinegar is a really great thing to mix with brisket. Anything acidic is going to be great, or sorry, with a rub. No, not with brisket, with a rub. Um, and the reason why is because once those acids get into the meat, they will start to um, break down and, and separate the proteins and break them down from the, from the fibers of the meat. And then what happens is that allows those proteins to merge together. When those proteins merge together, they're going to seal in juices, seal in flavoring um, inside the meat. So cider vinegar, and that's honestly, that's even what happens with, you know, wine. Same kind of things happening with wine. You're breaking down those proteins and you're saving them. And you're, and you're making them combine so that it creates more... Um, more juiciness, more desirable flavors. So I flip this around so that I can see this fat cap and kind of see where it begins and ends on the meat so we don't go too far down. And this is really it. And we're just kind of going through and trimming it up. And you kind of get to the point where the meat, sorry, the fat looks almost like a, like cotton candy a little bit. So right here is like super thin. So this I'm going to just go ahead and cut out. Isn't going to be good, isn't going to last the cook. So pile it up there. And then I'll cut this off here just to make it more symmetrical. Don't want any end pieces drying out. I feel like that one's just going to dry out sitting there. So right here we've already got about a quarter inch. Good there. Let's see. And you know, it's okay if you have like a few spots that you trim a little too much. You know, obviously, ideally, you don't want to do that, but it happens. You know, it's not going to be perfect, but we are going to make try to make this be as, as good as we possibly can. I'm um, really trying to kind of get this hump down a little bit just because I feel like that could cause some restrictions. And I want to make sure like it's going to cascade all, like it's going to float all the way down. I don't want to, I want to try to avoid juice puddling right here, right? So make it so it just looks smooth. It's going to go all the way down. It's going to flow. Um, and we're going to be able to render this fat really well without compromising the bark and without disrupting any of our any of our natural flavoring to the meat itself. This one's about done trimming. Just really want to look and see how this looks. And um, by the way, this this is a whole brisket. What that means is we have the point here and we have the flat here. The point is kind of like a big, huge ball of, of meat and fat. Um, it's typically the, well, it is the most tender, the juiciest part. It's got the most marbling in it. This over here is the flat. This is typically you see like at a restaurant that they'll serve. Um, usually just fat on the top and then not much fat in the actual meat itself. It's more lean. A lot of restaurants do use the, the point for like nachos and they can throw it in beans also. That sort of thing. For me, you know, I know a lot of a lot of people like to cook just just flats. I know some people that'll buy a whole brisket and then they'll, they'll cut it cut it in half or even try to cut sideways along the uh right here. There's a fat seam that runs right here. That's what connects the, the point to the flat. Um, these are really two different muscles, two different kinds of meat. That's one of the things that makes the brisket difficult to cook is that um, you're cooking two, di two dissimilar types of, or cuts of meat. So they cook differently, they react differently. Um, they cook differently, they react dif differently. 
they taste differently. Um, they taste different for sure, but um, it makes it difficult. And a lot of people will try to cut the brisket in half if they can, and, and or even along the fat seam, and they'll try to cook the, the flat separate from the point. Um, in my experience, I find it's best to cook a whole brisket with them intact, because what I find is that really it'll really, really help to tenderize and make the flat juicy. I feel like that a lot of the fat and a lot of the juices in the point are going to melt and flow into the, the, the flat and make the flat more tender and more juicy. I find that when I cook the flat by itself, that it actually kind of dries it out a little bit and it's not as good as it could be, for sure. So I've just got a little bit more fat over here to try and get off and then we'll do some seasoning put our rub on it and by the way I have the uh, smoker outside it's already lit it's going right now got it so that it's um, warming up while I'm doing all of this uh, normally I can do this much much faster but of course I'm slowing down to try and explain everything to y'all and to show you guys how, how I do things. So, got this thing trimmed up. Doesn't look too bad. Got a few spots that I kind of went a little too far. Um, again, that's okay. You know, put a little bit extra seasoning on there to protect it and usually, it, usually it'll be just fine. Um, typically I do the fat side up in my smoker just because the air, I have an offset um, where the air flows over the side. I find that most of the heat usually goes over the top of the meat, so I want to use this fat to try to, I'm actually using it to protect the meat from overheating and from burning. So use a pellet smoker or a smoker where the, most, most of the heat's on the bottom, you can actually flip this over upside down um, or fat side down to protect the, the meat that way. Use the fat to protect the meat. Um, it's the best thing you can do with the fat on a brisket. Okay, so I got all the seasonings, got the got my mustard mustard I'm gonna use to make the surface tacky to help keep the rub to stick to the meat. Um, I don't ever pre-season this, I don't ever dry brine my briskets. Again, I like to just keep them nice and 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 natural if I can, let the flavor of the beef itself stand out. I'm actually gonna cut a little bit more fat off of this now that I can see it better on this side. Try to get rid of this unnecessary stuff. It's not going to be great after it's cooked. Okay. Oh, and just you know, this hand right here is clean. This knife handle is always been clean, so I make it a point not to touch the meat with my right hand, even when it is gloved. Glove is just a precaution. So, anyways, I like to just use plain old mustard for my briskets. Not a whole lot of it. Just a very um, thin amount and then just spread it around so just enough to get the surface tacky make it sticky you're not going to taste this in the cook it's gonna it's, you don't even know it was there you know the smoke it's totally going to overpower it um, and I like to use for my rub just good old salt and pepper um, I use coarse ground pepper um, restaurant grinds, what the bottle says, but it's coarse ground, you can use cafe grind, 16 mesh, whatever it says. Um, there's lots of different things it'll say on the bottle, but it's all coarse ground. And then kosher salt. And I just use an even mixture, half and half, half salt, half pepper. Again, I, I like to make it so that just the flavors of the actual beef, the actual meat, stand out. I don't want to do anything to, to change that. So I really just want to use this the rub to create a texture on it and to create a good bark. Pepper is going to really help with the bark the most. That's why I use the, the thicker, more coarse ground pepper. Um, coarse ground pepper, kosher salt, that creates texture on the meat. Texture on the meat is actually going to attract smoke, attract good flavors of the smoke, and it's going to really create a nice bark on this. And it's also going to create good smoky flavor. So a lot of people like to mix in, you know, a lot of different things as well, like um, garlic and onion. And in my experience, 
what's going to really make the biggest difference is the quality of smoke you put you put this thing through the quality of, of cook the consistent temperatures is really what's going to matter i mean this thing is going to sit in the smoker for 10 12 13 14 sometimes up to 16 hours um, anything you do to it you know you put a, a hint of, of garlic in it or a tablespoon or a teaspoon of onion powder or whatever in your rub it's going to be a lot of that's going to be nullified just by the smoke itself and it's not really even going to be flavorful and it's not really going to make a difference. What makes the biggest difference on brisket is consistent temperature, one, and then clean smoke. So you have that good clean smoke, smoky flavor. Um, with the brisket, we don't want to over season it. We don't want to put too much rub on it. Just enough to make it so that we can get that bark going on it. So, but we do want to get all the all the edges all the way around. So I'll go ahead and do that on the sides that I can for now. Season that little fat piece right there a little bit extra. See if we can get that to have some good flavoring too. Okay. So we've got what for me is going to be the bottom side all seasoned up. Now, flip this bad boy over. Mustard on top, get enough done, just enough so we can spread it around, get the surface nice and tacky. Oh, and when, when you're when you're kind of trimming up your your brisket too on top and the fat on top, you know, kind of the consistency you want to look for is you want it to be kind of like cotton candy almost, just like nice and soft and pliable. I mean, it looks and kind of feels like cotton candy almost a little bit. That's kind of the best way I can describe it. So, again, we don't want to go, it, it, the one thing about brisket is it is possible to over-season it. And when you over-season it and you go to bite it, you'll know. So, just a good, I mean, a decent amount of seasoning, but just get it on there. Don't want to go crazy. And it's good, you know, you don't want to go back and forth, back and forth, and like, use like the bus stop thing over it. Just get it on there. And then do your sides. So we can kind of do the front of this, this brisket a little bit heavier. That'll really help to protect it from the heat. Because this, right, this side right here for me is going to be facing the firebox. So that's going to take the brunt of that heat. Um, so keep that. A little bit more season. Help to try to protect that if we can. Um, get these ends. Just get the sides seasoned. Again, all we're doing is we're just seasoning this to try and you know, a little bit of flavor on the outside, but also really just trying to make a really, really good bark that we that everybody loves and wants. So, just kind of hit it. I like to use my hand, and then what I'll do is I'll kind of put it on my hand and then or on the glove side right there and then I'll use then I'll just press it in to the meat with my glove. And that's the best way to actually get the sides seasoned. Okay, this brisket is trimmed and it is seasoned. Now it's just a matter of waiting for the uh, the cooker, the offset outside, to get to the temp that I need it to be at. Um, it's actually got a little bit hotter than I needed to, so I need to let it cool back down. But, you know, it was cold outside. Again, it's 17 degrees outside, so I really wanted to get a big fire in there, get that meat warmed up, get the air warmed up, so that when I put this in there, it's not going in there in a cold grate and a cold cold air, cold smoker. I want it to be warm and stay warm. Keep it warm all throughout. I will put a, a temp gauge. I've always just put it kind of right here in the thickest part of the of the, the, the point. 
I know a lot of people put it in the flat, some people put it, put it in the middle where the flat goes into the point. For me, I just, I found that it's best for me just to put it right here. Put it here, plus right here is where the air is going to flow over. I use a meter um, thermometer, uh, 10 probes. So that 10 probe right here is, has the ambient temperature. So when I put it here, I can know the exact temp when the air is at its hottest. Um, I can monitor that at any time to make sure that it's consistent up there, but also to make sure it never gets too hot. Um, again, for me, I don't use the temperature to know when the meat is done. I use it to help monitor the meat, help to monitor the status of it, the cook, how it's coming along, help to make sure that I'm uh, keeping an eye on it. Ultimately, we're going to go off of feel. I'm going to pick this thing up with some, with some barbecue gloves and feel it to know when it's when it's ready to go. But we'll get to more of that later. Uh, for now, I'm just going to go outside, finish getting the, the fire ready, and get this thing on there. So I'm getting ready to put the brisket in the smoker. Just kind of want to show you guys some of the things I'm look, looking for to make sure that the it's ready to go and that we're going to get the best possible flavor for our meat. Um, with, with brisket especially, but really with any meat, and that first 30 minutes is really going to be the flavor that you're going to produce. That, that's the flavor of your smoke that you're going to taste all throughout. Um, in a long, long cook like this, the last thing I wanted to do was to ruin it in that first 30 minutes. So I want to make sure that the smoke is, is the right consistency, the right kind of flavor that it's going to hit that meat right off the bat. And then we're just going to build on that throughout the cook. Um, yeah. So the biggest thing we want to watch for is the smokestack. I um, want it to be clear. You know, there's kind of the smoke right there. But really, it's just kind of clear coming out of the smokestack. Maybe a little bit of bluing in it, but that's okay. What we don't want is big, huge, black, puffy clouds of smoke. The way we avoid this is by just having a roaring hot fire. Don't want the logs simmering. Don't want them smoldering. Um, we really want the fire just to be producing that good, clean smoke. Um, in the actual firebox itself, you know, there's what we've got. Again, it's 17 degrees out right now, so it's super cold super super chill need to make sure we can overcome that with a good warm fire something i like to do is kind of put the fire further into the to the firebox a little bit but then build a cool bed out here so that it kind of pre-warms the air as it's coming through and hitting that fire um, also one thing too to note with fire once the wood kind of goes to that ashy black color it's not actually producing smoke anymore um, so that's always a good time to know when it's time to put some more wood on and when you want to get some more smoke flavor in there. Put a new piece of wood on and, and let it burn. You know, that first like 10, 15, 20 minutes, that's when it's producing smoke. Beyond that, when it goes black and ashy, it's producing heat, not really producing any flavor though. So another thing to watch for. Another thing you can do too um, is just right before you put your brisket on or any meat on, just go ahead and which is kind of what I've done back there. Throw some, some new logs on, let them catch, let them get going, and then get them ready to go. That, that, that gets your smoke, that gets, and then just kind of watch your smokestack. Get the smokestack so it's good and clean air, good clean smoke coming through there. But that's gonna make it so that your brisket's gonna have that flavor right off the bat. You know, I'm gonna start off with the temperature, I'm waiting for the temperature gauge over here to kind of drop down to about 255. Once it hits that 255 point, that's when I'm going to throw this on. I'm going to start off with it for the first few hours at 255, then gradually, in, gradually increase it until we get up to 275, which we're probably going to end at by the time we're done cooking this thing. So uh, we'll be back soon. All right, it's been about three hours now since we put the, the brisket in the smoker this morning. Um, haven't opened the lid once, just trying to get a lot of good smoky. Uh, flavor into it and really get it cooking. I don't normally open it up until at least like three hours to kind of check it and do a quick spritz. So we're just going to spritz it real quick. Um, I like to use apple cider vinegar. Um, like I said uh, in the previous time that with uh, cider vinegar, you know, the acid in it really helps to break down the collagen and weaken the collagen and the protein in the meat. Um, and when that happens and the proteins start to break loose, um, they can bond with each other, which locks in juices and moisture into the meat and really helps it to be tender and, and good. 
and keep that juice in there so that not only we spritz it to keep it moist, but we also spritz it to help with the breakdown of those proteins and those collagens. So I'm gonna go ahead and open the lid and see how things are looking. So let's see here. So there's the brisket right there. You can kind of see it. Um, one thing I want to point out, you know, the, br the bark is setting up nicely. Um, it's really starting to kind of dry out and form for us. Um, there's no puddling on top of the brisket. This is because of the way that we trimmed it. This was the, the result that I was looking for in trying to make it smooth, trying to make it so that everything can flow right off of it, make it aerodynamically sound. There's nowhere for any of it to puddle, um, which is exactly what I want because that puddling will ruin the bark. And yes, this up here, this is a pork butt. Um, I'm cooking a pork butt also. Um, and I do make a, another video. It's already, up on, it's already up on YouTube, up on the channel. It's been up for quite a while. Um, but I made it a while ago. If you want to see how I make pork butt, it's on there. It's not this pork butt, but it is a pork butt that I made. Different one. So when I do the spritzing, I don't like to have like a mist on the spritz. Because if you mist, you know, as soon as it hits the meat, it's just going to evaporate. It's not actually going to stay there. But I also don't want to have like a stream to where I'm going to knock the bark off. So kind of like an in-between, just kind of like feather it and just really get it. Just kind of hit the dry spots, hit this front really good. Just to keep it from drying out, keep it moist. We'll do this on the pork butt as well. It's in here. And then I'll go ahead and close the lid. So something that I'm going to do is I'll just come out here and I'll check this about every hour. Um, at this point, just come in here and check it, spritz it, uh, close the lid, and keep doing so until it's until it's time and ready to wrap. them. once we get to that point, uh, we'll come out here and I'll show you how to know when it's ready to wrap and how to to get it ready for that next step of the cook. All right, so now it's been uh, several hours since the last video. We're up to about six hours with it in the smoker. Um, just want to come out here and check it, and make you see what it looks like. See how things are coming along. I think it's probably about close to being ready to wrap. Um, one thing I did want to note: so for the first, you know, three hours, I kept the temp at about two. Kept the temp right at two fifty-five. Um, keep it right there. Try to get as much of that good smoke flavor in there. Try not to cook it too fast. Um, and then after I, you know, I check it and I do that first spritz. At that point, I actually bumped the temperature to about two sixty-five, and have been keeping it there um, ever since. Um, once we wrap it, then I'll actually go ahead and bump the temp to 275 on this and then you keep it at 275 all the way to the end. Um, you know, if you're using a pellet smoker, you know, you could... Everybody says 225 is the temp you want to go with. Um, I would say probably start at 225, but then you could slowly bump the temp on that also. Uh, the most important thing with brisket especially is you want to just have that consistent temperature so the, um, you know, the pores... Of, of the brisket will actually open and close as you have too much temperature fluctuation. So you really want to try to keep a good, consistent, um, even temperature running all throughout the cook. Um, that's super critical, super important. Best way to do that is just watch your temp gauge over here on the on the smoker or use your meter. If you have a meter or any type of a, um, a thermometer or a meat gauge that will tell you the ambient temperature of your of your cooker, Use that also, um, but consistent temperature, super critical, super important, something you always want to watch for um, as well, especially with brisket. Keep that keep that temperature consistent and make sure the brisket, um, those pores don't open and close too much to where the meat isn't as good. Um, if you've ever been to like some of those more uh, you know famous or popular barbecue chains where you look at the brisket, it looks like it almost has like little air bubbles in the meat. Um, that's what happens when you have inconsistent temperatures. The temperature goes up and down, too much fluctuation, and you end up having those bubbles um, that you just don't want. Doesn't make them. Doesn't make the meat very good. Brisket is, brisket is not as good as what it should be um, in that case. So let's go ahead and open this. All right. So it's all looking really, really good. Um, again, no puddles forming on the brisket, which is exactly what we want to see. Got a nice, good bark forming uh, formulation starting. I mean, kind of see it's starting to bubble up a little bit um, on that end there. So some of the juices are starting to come out, starting to get into that stall period. Um, 
be about another 15, 20 minutes and it should be ready to wrap. So just enough time for me to go inside and get um, everything prepped for wrapping. And on a side note, the uh, fat seam right there on the pork butt is uh, splitting. So that's, that one's ready to wrap also. So um, I'll go in, um, we'll go inside and, and get set, get ready to start uh, wrapping the, the brisket and get it back to cooking. All right, so here it is. You know, getting ready to uh, wrap wrap the brisket. You know, what I use is butcher paper. Um, I like butcher paper a lot. Uh, this pink butcher paper is made specifically for, for smoking meats. Um, now, the reason why I like butcher paper is it's a good way to wrap the meat. To You can kind of help it through the stall a little bit. Uh, but you can also really just um, keep the juices preserved inside the meat without ruining the bark. Um, I find that butcher paper allows it to the meat to breathe just a little bit and allows the the bark to not become saturated with juice and to soften, um, which is you know you kind of, like if you wanted to use foil for instance, foil would give you that effect. You would have um, it, would, it would give it almost like a like a pot roast um, kind of a texture, like like you've been cooking in a slow cooker for for hours. Um, you know, to me, when you're when you're smoking meat, when you're making barbecue, you know, our the whole goal is to create that bark, and we don't want to ruin that bark with the wrap. So for me, I don't I don't like to use foil um, for that purpose. You can use it if you want to. If you want a soft, um, spongy texture, like go for the foil. You'll get that, and it'll work out great for you. But if you're like me, and you like you want the bark and you want that texture, um, you really need to just go with Put your paper, you know, or if you don't want to wrap it, you don't have to wrap it at all. It will kind of dry the meat out a little bit. Um, it will take longer to get through the stall. You may have to bump your temperatures up even a little bit more, um, but you, you can certainly do that also. So not, not really a right or a wrong. It's more a matter of preference, and I'm just trying to explain to you the different options and, and what to expect from, from going the different paths. So for me, you know, what I like to do is I like to use um, cider vinegar again. So, but again, back to the butcher paper real quick. You know, I have two pieces of butcher paper. I, I just kind of try to make it long enough so that you can roll your brisket, you know, three, four times in the paper. But um, I use two, pe two pieces to make sure that it's plenty long to fold over and cover the front of the brisket um, plenty well. So first we'll start with just some cider vinegar. And what I do is I just, Pretty much, I don't drench the butcher paper, but I get it plenty damp, plenty wet. Um, you know, this is our last chance to really see the brisket and keep it from drying out and to keep it nice and moist. Um, again, the acid in the cider vinegar is going to really help to break down the collagen and the proteins and, and keep them, keep, keep the meat moist and promote it to be moist. So. I always kind of wet the paper with that. I find it's just very helpful keeping it, keeping the meat uh, dr moist, not letting it dry out even while it's wrapped. Um, then what I like to do is just take some beef tallow. I don't always do this, but I decided to do it today. Um, but just kind of where I'm going to lay the brisket at, just kind of squirt some tallow there. It doesn't take a ton of it, but. Wrapping it in beef tallow, I find, really helps, um, really helps with, with the tenderness and the juiciness of the meat. You know, you wrap it in that tallow, it gets on the outside of the meat, really kind of doesn't, um, doesn't soften or moisten the, bris the, the bark or the brisket, but it definitely makes it juicy and preserves that juiciness that we're trying to keep inside the meat. Um, this eventually kind of seems to kind of work into the meat. And really help it to be juicy but also it helps the uh to give like that shiny sparkle not not a sparkle but more of like a shiny um appearance to the brisket when you unwrap it where it's like the light reflects off of it and it just looks really really great really really awesome so um yeah beef towel it's a, one of those little secrets that you can do don't have to do it i don't always do it but um but i do do it as often as i can so now I'm gonna go ahead and use my uh, trusty barbecue gloves and we're gonna pull the meat off the, the smoker, bring it inside and wrap it. So um, I don't ever 
use tongs to pull my meat off of the smoker. I always use gloves or my hands. Um, I try to be as careful as I can to not ruin any of the bark they were creating. I feel like tongs will ruin it. Um, so picking it up with your hands, using gloves, using a towel, whatever, really helps to preserve that bark and to make it nice and, and keep, it, keep it all together. We don't want to break it up or have tongue marks or anything like that on our meat. Um, so I always definitely try to avoid that as well. So be right back with the meat and then we'll go ahead and, and start wrapping. Okay, so here it is. Man, this thing just looks so awesome. Um, nice, dark, black bark, just the way that we want it. Um, again, no, no puddling on the flat, which happens a lot of times if you don't trim properly, get that puddling, so we avoided that. Um, which, really helps to, which really helps that bark to form and just make it really, really great and really, really good. I'm gonna go ahead and pull the meat probe out. So, whew, that's a little hot. One thing I will say that it's kind of a rub for me with the meter probes that I have found is that you can't keep them in the meat when you um, after you wrap it. Like I can't leave this in the meat and then wrap over it. Um, once I wrap the meat, it's actually going to lose connect lose connection with the meter block, and it'll stop. I'll stop being able to get a signal from the probe, um, which I just don't like about it. But just the way it is so um, so I have to take it out and then wrap it and unfortunately I do have to put it back in but I found it's not really a big deal I've never really seen or noticed any issues from that um, in my own personal experience but we'll just kind of hold this over like that get it so it's just nice and tight with the meat um, drag it down here give it some space and I just fold it over. Fold it over like so. Again, trying to make it so it's just nice and tight up against the meat. Don't want any air pockets. Just want to really seal it all in. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to rip the paper, of course. So we're going to do our best to avoid that. Here it is. And I definitely want it to end so that the top is on top after I'm done um, wrapping it as well. So go ahead and go over one more time and then one more time. And then if you want, you know, you can always um, trim up any of these little pieces here if you're ever concerned that they're going to burn up or whatever. Um, you can always trim up any loose pieces with some scissors. This time I didn't have to. Hooray! So, and then here, put the meter probe back in. So I always kind of like hold the meter probe kind of like where I'm going to put it. Get a bit good visual of where I need to stop on the meter probe to get to where I want it to be. And then just Stick it back in. Again, the meter probe, not gonna be used to tell us when this is done. It's really gonna be used to let us know when it's time to uh, start checking it and to monitor it, monitor the progress of it, make sure it's coming along like it should. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this back on the smoker and pretty much just gonna leave it in there until it's time to, um, to check it for done. You know, I'll bump the temp up to 275 now um, kind of push this thing through the stall, get it going, get it get it all the way to, to the finish. Um, one thing I did want to mention about the stall, you know, and I find with, at elevation where the meat, where the water, you know, is going to boil faster. And, you know, at elevation where the water is going to boil faster, where the... Uh, the fire doesn't burn as efficient as it does at, at lower elevations. You don't really want to keep your meat in the stall for too long. Um, I find, you know, a half hour at max is where I kind of like where I want to like wait, give it before I start bumping the temp up to really kind of push it through the stall quickly. Uh, the quicker you can get it through the stall, the more water you can keep in, in the actual meat itself. At elevation, it seems to be better. 
Um, it makes it so that it doesn't dry out as quickly. It makes it so when you start pushing that temp up to that, you know, 204 degree mark, um, which for me, you know, my elevation, the boiling point is 204, 204.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so I want to make sure that I, I keep as, as much water retention inside the meat to keep it from, from evaporating and frankly drying out. Um, so pushing it through the stall a little bit faster, I find really, really helps, really, really benefits the meat and the overall um, end product. So keep that in mind when you're when you're cooking and you know factor in you know your elevation and how quickly the water is going to start to dissipate from the meat. Make sure that you're um, that you're accounting for that and that you're not letting your meat just sit in the stall and push all the juices and all the moisture and all the water out of it um, longer than it needs to. So gonna go ahead and get this back on the cooker now. I don't want it to cool off too much and then. So something I wanted to address really quickly, um, now that I've got the, the brisket back in the smoker, um, you know, something that I get asked a lot is why, why do you even put the meat back in the smoker after it's wrapped? Like once it's wrapped, doesn't it stop? Taking on the smoke flavor that you're trying to create from having in the smoker, like why not just throw it <coughs> back in the oven? You know, for me, my experience, I have found that Changing the heat source, especially on something like, uh, as sensitive as a brisket, which brisket is not, um, <coughs> it, it's really easy to screw up. Um, it's one of those meats that is that it's definitely on the. Uh, as far as like a, if, there, if there was a difficulty scale for smoking meats, like brisket's definitely at the top of that scale, as far as difficulty goes. And it, it's very sensitive, and it's very easy to screw up. Like I mentioned before, you know, you want to have consistent temps so that you're not. Um, opening and closing those pores. Um, I feel like that's kind of the same thing putting it in an oven. In my experience, putting it in an oven, you know, even if you put it in there like 225, 250, 275, whatever you want to put it at, you're changing your heat source. You're going from indirect heat in the smoker to direct heat in the oven. Um, that direct heat is going to change the way the meat is warming. It's not going to necessarily warm from air flowing over the top of it. It's going to warm from the bottom up and it's going to potentially dry it out. You're going to lose some juices. You're going to potentially make your meat be a little bit more soggy than it should be. Definitely won't be as juicy as what it should be. These are just kind of the things that I found putting it in, putting it in an oven as opposed to just putting it back on the smoker. I get it. Oven's easier. Maybe you're running out of wood, running out of pellets. You don't have a choice. Um, um, I, you know, I wouldn't have recommend it, but I, I, I guess it's okay. It, um, you know, the meat, at the end of the day, it'll probably be okay. It's fine. You know, just as long as you're willing to, you know, repent to the barbecue gods for it later, it'll be okay. But do what you gotta do. All right, so I'm out here gonna start checking the brisket to see if it's done. Gonna do this by feel. Um, you know, one thing I do want to call out about this is that it's not something that I came up with on my own. It's actually um, something, an idea that I stole from Aaron Franklin. Um, something that I saw him do, and it just made sense to me. It's how I've always done it. Um, again, his reasoning is the same reasoning as mine, that every animal is different. Meat comes from animals, so therefore every piece of meat is different. They all cook different. Time and temperature aren't always going to be the same for every piece of meat, um, because they're all different. So, go off of feel, pick up the meat and see how it feels, and know when it's done based upon how it feels. So right now, this one's temping at about 200 degrees. Um, so I'm just going to pick it up and kind of get a baseline gauge of how it's feeling. So it's feeling like it's getting softer. It's feeling better. Um, it's definitely getting there, but it's not, not there yet. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of hard to explain um, what, to feel, what to feel for and, and how to know. Ultimately, it just kind of comes down to experience, doing it a bunch of times. Um, you know, you just kind of pick it up, and when your hand feels like it's starting to, like, melt into the meat from the bottom, then you can kind of squish it from the top also a little bit. You don't want to push juices out, but you want to just kind of squish it a bit just to um, really kind of feel for the sponginess and the squishiness of it and see if it's going to bounce back or kind of what it does. Um, right now, it still feels kind of stiff, stiff, so I didn't even bother trying to push on the top. You know, 
something that I've kind of learned is that this is the best way to know when your brisket's done. Um, it does take a few tries. It takes it takes several tries actually before you get it down, where you really feel comfortable in knowing how to tell your meat's done based on feel. Um, took me several tries. You know, you pull. I kind of find typically you pull it off too soon, um, and the meat just isn't quite as tender as it could be. So you remember that. You can even write down if you need to. Come back next time and do, try it again. And it'll be, um, you know, let, let it go a little bit longer and pick it up and feel it and then try it out, see how it tastes, see how it feels. You know, the one thing that I will tell you is once you do get it down, once you do figure out how the meat feels when it's done, that's something that you'll never forget. The next time you go to cook it, when you pick it up and you recognize that feel, you're going to know it and you're going to know your meat's done and you're going to be able to consistently make really, really great brisket that's cooked consistently and well over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, it does take some tries. That, you know, it's bar as much of a, a science that barbecue is, it's also an art. Um, it's something that you have to do by through experience. You have to learn through experience. You have to learn through trying. Um, there isn't a set in stone method or path that I could lead you down or anybody could really lead anybody down. Um, there is an art to it and that art requires experience, requires time and you just have to do it. Um, but once you do it, once you figure it out, um, it certainly is magical. Okay, so back out here to check this brisket again. Um, let's check it for done. I think it's probably going to be done. It's been about an hour, well, about 45 minutes since we checked it last. Um, right now it's registering at about 2.03. Um, you know, with briskets, I pulled them off and had them feel done anywhere from about 199 to 204. Um, to be fair, I will say 203 is the most common temperature that I've had them be done at. So, but you can see now, just looking at it, you can see the bend. I can kind of squeeze it a little bit and feel the softness. This one is done. Totally, totally done. Just kind of squeeze it up here, feel the bounce back, feel the it's kind of folding over my hand and it's folding over my hand under its own weight. Apologize for the neighbor's dogs, can't do much about that. Um, so now we're just gonna pull that and then let it rest. Um, you know, for resting, you want to let it go to about get down to about 140 degrees in temperature before you slice it. You know, 150 is probably the minimum you'd want to go down to, but at least, but 140 is ideal. Get it down to 140, unwrap it. Um, when you're ready to start serving it, slice it, you know. Um, you can wrap it up, put it in a cooler if you want to, if you want to let it rest for even longer. Otherwise, just simply, you know, put it in your on your on your countertop, put it in, in your garage on the cement. Put it in the fridge if you, you know. I, I wouldn't put it in the fridge. Put it on the cement if you want to. Let it rest wherever you want to. Um, just get it down to that temp so that it's uh, can absorb those juices, absorb that moisture. Um, usually it takes a few hours. You know, the longer you can let your meat, meat rest, the better for sure. Um, let it rest for as long as you possibly can. Um, gonna make it just a lot better, a lot better flavors. So, you know, next step is what, after this is done resting, we'll unwrap it and slice it and serve it. So we'll show you how to cut it Okay, up. so here we have it. Uh, the brisket turned out fantastically. Just wanted to show everybody it. Um, the bark looks amazing. Looks really, really great. You can notice here on top, you know, the bark was all the way across. Um, got nice and black, just how we like it. Um, you know, we trimmed it really well to make it so that, again, pointed out before to make it so that none of the puddle, none of the puddling occurs on top of the meat, um, which is something we really want to avoid. Trim it so it's all nice and smooth. Air flows over it. The, the moisture can flow over it also. Nothing puddles up on here on top of the top of the flat. Um, get that really nice bark all the way across. Really nice, consistent. This is what the black pepper helps to create also. With that texture, it really helps to um, attract that smoke. Get this bark that, that we're shooting for. So. Gonna go ahead and start slicing it now. Um, I always like to just start um, on this side over here with the flat, work my way across over to the point, 
um, where we'll kind of cut it and then cut a little bit differently. So I'm just going to go ahead and start here. Just, you know, cut the end piece off. You know what? Just made a big boo boo. No, we didn't. We're good. So here, as you can see, nice and jiggly, nice and wiggly, exactly how we like it. Um, here's, you know, the bottom side of it with all the fat and everything. Just looking really, really great. So. Really happy with how this turned out and how everything went. Now we're just going to slice it across. Super tender, super good. Super juicy, coming apart just like how I wanted it to. Um, I'm actually going to try cutting it this way, see if we can kind of keep it together a little bit better. Oh, yeah, there we go. Get that fat. So, you know, when I'm slicing it, I try to keep it about a quarter inch thick on the, um, on the flat side. Just really try to keep it from, uh, just try to keep it from, you know, getting too, too thin, too thick. You kind of notice when you go to like, if somebody's trying to compensate for a brisket that's maybe overcooked, they will try to, um, you know, they'll try to cut it a little bit thicker to make it so it doesn't fall apart quite as easily. I also like to usually cut this in half. Now this is just a good piece, all the seasonings right there. Good piece to try. We'll go ahead and just try it real quick. Um, yeah, it tastes fantastic. Tastes exactly how I wanted it to. Exactly how I would expect it to taste. Um, you can kind of see here too, where it's, you know, shiny and wiggly. This is what the, um, This is what that, uh, you know, melting that, that uh, towel is going to do. And you don't really have to do it, but it's definitely something that's nice to do. Give you a little bit better um, shine to it and, and appeal to it, make it more tender, more soft. But anyway, it's kind of what I was saying with um, slicing, you know, if somebody goes extra thin, they're trying to compensate for it being dried out or not cooked enough or just tough till. Um, so they go extra thin to try and make it, give it that illusion of being nice and tender and, and soft. Or then you have the other way where they'll go too thick, where if it's overcooked or whatever and it's just falling apart or flaking, they'll try to compensate that way as well. Um, for me, I, I just don't really like to have to do any of that, just try to make it nice and consistent. About a quarter inch, think about like a, just like a pencil, a pencil width is, is a good, good kind of gauge to go with. So here it is, um, nice, juicy, great, great fat up top there, good rendering of the fat, um, and then just pulls right apart, not very hard at all, which is exactly how we want it. We want it to be able to, you know, stick together, pull together on its own, but at the same time, um, you know, as soon as you give it any kind of a tug or a pull, it's just going to come right apart. So for me, I like to go right down the middle on these flat pieces, just to make it so it'll go a little bit further. Serving, uh, when you're serving a lot of people, you know, try to make it so as many people that want some can get some, for sure. Yeah, and see like this right here, I mean this is the end, this is kind of what I would expect. But definitely overdone on the end there a little bit, um, which will happen. And then it just kind of flakes and, and dries and dries out and flakes apart. So, anyway, just going to continue cutting them about. I'll do a few more slices this way. 
on this flat just to kind of get a little bit more. For the people that like the leaner stuff, and then we'll go ahead and work on the point and get the get the marbleized uh, meat ready for those people that like the marbleized. So there it is again, another piece, just super awesome, super tendy, tender. You can kind of squish it, and squeeze. You can see here it's all together. There isn't a whole lot of these air bubbles, air pockets, so that means we didn't we didn't ruin it by uh, inconsistent temperatures with pores opening and closing. Um, everything is really looking exactly the way that I wanted it to. Looking really, really good. Tasted, it tasted great on that piece that I tried. I um, really liked it a lot. It's smoky flavor to it, but the, uh, the seasoning isn't overpowering. You know, we didn't over season this, that's for sure. Try some more pieces right here. Yeah, that's great. So now we're gonna get to the point. We're gonna we're gonna start slicing this one up. So part of this right here where this seam fat is, I like to kind of cut that out. Um, just because it really just isn't all that great. It's just usually burned up fat. Um, it's been taking on a lot of heat. You know, it's been right up front, and I know a lot of people like it, and a lot of people will eat it, but to me, it just isn't great. So, I'm going to go ahead and just slice this. So, if you notice, I turned the point, right? So, this right here is where the flat was, so we cut the flat this way, then get the flat done, get to the point, and now we turn it, and we cut it a different direction. Um, again, we're dealing with two different muscle groups, right? Two different types of, of, of meat. So we have two different grains, so we're trying to cut these with the grains, both of them. So here's our flat, or sorry, our point. You can see right here, just nice and juicy, nice and tender. Right here is where the flat runs underneath um, the point. So this is going to be a little bit, um, a little bit leaner. Typically it's not quite as good. A lot of times I'll just totally cut this out, and we'll just use just this uh, point meat up here. Because it really, to me, just isn't good, isn't great. Sometimes I'll save it and serve it to people that really want it, but overall, you can see right there, there's your, your rendered fat. Just really, really nice, really, really great. Um, yeah, and this just, I mean, there's not, I mean, it's just stiff. There's not a lot of juice to it. So, I'm going to throw that one away. These, so for the point, I'll typically go just a little bit wider, more like three eighths of an inch um, for width on these. I just feel fine. It sticks, it stays together better. Works really well doing it this way. So get these pieces sliced up. Um, for me, I'm more of a you know I like the flat. My wife, half of my kids really like the point. So I typically will do both and cut up both, serve both. But if you don't, if you're someone that doesn't like the point, if you don't like all of this extra fat, you know, by all means, use you know, set this aside and use it for, um, you know, chop it up and put it in beans. You can do that. You can put it in. That's just my fat. You can put it in. Um, like a lot of places you use this for like nachos. So you can make nachos with it. You can make. Um, you know, chop it up, put it on like a sandwich. You know, typically with this with this stuff, you just chop it up, right? Um, don't usually just serve it like this. Like you don't usually go to a restaurant; they just give you a piece of piece of it. And a lot of them, if it's an authentic place, they will, and they'll ask you like, do you want the do you want the lean or do you want fatty, right? Or marble marble ice, sometimes we even call it. So, fatty is the point. Here's your fatty. Lean is the flat. So for this one. Go ahead and just cut this out again. Just isn't, like I said, I know a lot of people like this and they're probably thinking I'm killing it, but it, it, this just isn't great. Um, I just don't like giving to people, so we'll probably, you know, that way we can maybe chop up and put in, you know, some beans and reuse it that way. Um, maybe restore some of that moisture, but for the purpose of this, for what I'm going to serve people to actually eat, we're just going to go with what I know looks good. 
And if you, you know, and if, and if you are somebody who says, you know what, I don't really care. I want to eat this. Like by all means, don't cut it out. Just keep it there and just eat it. Nothing wrong with it. It's all just, you know, preference and a matter of what you want, a matter of what you like. There we have it. Our brisket is trimmed. Our brisket is ready to go. Brisket is done and I'm ready to serve. So for me, you know, I typically don't cut this up until right before I'm ready to serve it. As soon as you cut this meat up, it's going to start to oxidize, it's going to start to gray, change color, something I like to try to avoid. So of course, you know, I always wait till right before we're going to eat it, right before we're going to serve it to actually slice it. A lot of times I'll even just wait until people are ready for it and coming up and getting it and I'll just slice it and give it to them in the moment. But uh, the important thing is, 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 you know, again, trimming right off the bat, trim it right, get the, get it so it's, so it's, air can flow well. And even if you're using a pellet grill and the air is not going to flow over it, you still want to have it be smooth on top so that the, so that the, if there's any runoff, it's going to run all the way off. It's not going to pool up on top of the uh, bark. It's not going to pool up on top of the flat and ruin your bark. And then you also want to just really make sure that you um, don't over-season it. Keep consistent temperatures. Um, I don't recommend using injections and marinades. If you really want to, you can. But to me, I, I want to make the flavor of the actual beef stand out. Make it so when I take a bite of this, that I taste the beef. The beef is what I'm really tasting. I'm just trying to highlight that of what I'm doing with the smoke and with the seasoning. So clean smoke. Don't over season it. Don't overdo it. Keep it simple. When it feels soft, when it feels squishy, when it feels done, pull it off and, and it's done. So, um, so. That's pretty much it, you know, just, and then when, once it's trimmed up, just go ahead and serve it and start eating right away. Oh, I did want to mention though, so with uh, the resting it, you know, I did let, let this rest all the way down to 140. Um, typically you want to, you know, get it to at least 150. FDA says, you know, you need to, you need to serve it, but you can't really get below 140 before you serve it. But, you know, you can go as low as you want to. The, the, lo the longer you can let this thing rest, the better. It's going to be juicier, it's going to be better, it's going to be flavorful. The last thing you want to do is to spend half a day making a brisket, pull it off, and then slice it right away. Um, you're just going to destroy it. It's not going to be as good. It's not going to be as tender as juicy. Like, let it rest, let it sit, then enjoy it. So always plan ahead with your cooks. I always like to start from, I want to have dinner at 6. So I count backwards. Okay, that means I need to have it off the cooker by two. So I've got four hours for it to rest. So if I'm going to, two o'clock needs to be off, I need to start at 2 a.m. to make sure I've got plenty of time to get it done. Um, and that's really the way that you have to do it. There's no other way around it. So anyways, until next time, please, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. Leave comments. Tell me how you think I did. Tell me what you like, what you don't like. If you have any suggestions, let me know. I'm happy to have suggestions. If there's something you want me to cook or something that you wish that I would show that I didn't show on this, comment, just comment whatever you want to say. Just comment, let me know what you think. Um, I really want to have people's input. I feel like that's the best way to learn um, and want to learn from, from, a, from a wealth of, of knowledge and wealth of other people. So um, please like and subscribe and, and help me keep this channel going. Really need to get my, really want to get my subscriber count up so that I can start to really cook more and do more cooks and do more different meats. And, and make this successful and be able to help other people. Until um, so next time.